Chair Ballard, I want to change gears a little bit. In the presidential primary campaign that's been going on for the last nine months or so, your name has come up often, and many Republican candidates have said that they probably wouldn't want to give you a third term. So I wanted to give you a chance to talk about that. Do you want another term you've had on the Fed? What, what's your stance on that? I don't have a stance on that. I am. Uh... It's not something I'm focused on. Focused on doing our jobs. We have we're, this year is going to be a highly consequential year for for the Fed and for monetary policy, and we're all of us very buckled down, focused on doing our jobs to promote maximum employment and stable prices for the American people. The economy has made good progress toward our dual mandate objectives. Inflation has eased from its highs without a significant increase in unemployment. That's very good news. But inflation is still too high, ongoing progress in bringing it down is not assured, and the path forward is uncertain. I want to assure the American people that we are fully committed to returning inflation to our 2% goal. Restoring price stability is essential to achieve a sustained period of strong labor market conditions that benefit all. Today, the FOMC decided to leave our policy interest rate unchanged and to continue to reduce our securities holdings. Over the past two years, we have significantly tightened the stance of monetary policy. Our strong actions have moved our policy rate well into restrictive territory, and we've been seeing the effects on economic activity <clears throat> and inflation. As labor market tightness has eased and progress on inflation has continued, the risks to achieving our employment and inflation goals are moving into better balance. I will have more to say about monetary policy about monetary policy after briefly reviewing economic developments. We believe that our policy rate is likely at its peak for this tightening cycle, and that, if the economy evolves broadly as expected, it will likely be appropriate to begin dialing back policy restraint at some point this year. But the economy has surprised forecasters in many ways since the pandemic, and ongoing progress toward our 2% inflation objective is not assured. The economic outlook is uncertain, and we remain highly attentive to inflation risks. We are prepared to maintain the current target range for the federal funds rate for longer, if appropriate. As labor market tightness has eased and progress on inflation has continued, the risks to achieving our employment and inflation goals are moving into better balance. We know that reducing policy restraint too soon or too much could result in a reversal of the progress we've seen on inflation and ultimately require even tighter policy to get inflation back to 2%. At the same time, reducing policy restraint too late or too little could unduly weaken economic activity and employment. In considering any adjustments to the target range for the federal funds rate, the committee will carefully assess the incoming data, the evolving outlook, and the balance of risks. The committee does not expect that it will be appropriate to reduce the target range until it has gained greater confidence that inflation is moving sustainably toward 2%. We will continue to make our decisions meeting by meeting. We remain committed to bringing inflation back down to our 2% goal and to keeping longer-term longer inflation expectations well anchored. Restoring price stability is essential to set the stage for achieving maximum employment and stable prices over the longer run. To conclude, we understand that our actions affect communities, families, and businesses across the country. Everything we do is in service to our public mission. We at the Fed will do everything we can to achieve our maximum employment and price stability goals. Thank you. Well, is there anything that you're seeing in the data that makes you doubt that it's a true signal at this stage? No, I think it's, I, I would say it, it seems it seems to be the likely case that, that we will achieve that confidence, but we have to achieve it and we haven't yet. And so... Uh, I, I mean, it's a good story. We have six months of good inflation, but you can, and you know this, you can look behind those numbers and you can see that a lot of it's been coming from goods inflation, for example, and goods inflation running significantly negative. It's a reasonable assumption that over time, goods inflation will flatten out, probably approximate zero. That would mean the services sectors would have to contribute more. So in other words, what we care about is the aggregate number, not so much the composition, but we, we just need to see more. That's where we are uh, as, as a committee. We need to see more evidence that sort of confirms what we think we're seeing and that tells us that we are on, gives us confidence that we're on, uh, on a path to, a sustainable path down to 2% inflation.
almost every participant on the committee does believe that it will be appropriate to reduce rates. And uh, for, for partly for the reasons that you say, you know, we, we feel like inflation is coming down. Uh, growth has been strong. The labor market is strong. Um, we're, what we're trying to do is identify a place where we're really confident about inflation getting, getting back down 2 percent so that we can then begin uh, the process of dialing back the restrictive level. Uh, so overall, I think, I think people do believe, and as you know, the median participant wrote down three rate cuts this year. Uh, but uh, I think to get to that place where we feel comfortable starting the process, we need some confirmation that inflation is in fact coming down sustainably to 2 percent. If I could ask differently, uh, if, if you hold rates high as inflation moderates, as it, as it has been, target rates will exceed the prescriptions of the Taylor rule or experience. What would be the reasoning for holding rates higher than the levels recommended by those rules uh, in the current instance? Well, I, look, I think, as you know, we consult a range of Taylor rules and, and non-Taylor kind of rules. We consult them regularly. They're in our, our teal book and, and uh, uh, they're in the, all the materials that we look at. But you know, I don't think we've ever been at a state at a place where we were where we were setting policy by them, um, and they're depending on the rule. Uh, it will tell you different things. There are many different formulations. Another way to think about it is uh, implicitly is um, so. In theory, of course, real rates go up if holding all else equal as inflation comes down, but that doesn't mean we can mechanically adjust policy as real rates, uh, sorry, as inflation comes down. It doesn't mean that at all because, for one thing, uh, we, we don't know. We, we look at more than just the Fed funds rate. We look at broadly financial conditions. But in addition, we don't know with great confidence where the neutral rate of interest is at any given time. But that also doesn't mean that we wait around for uh, to see, uh, you know, the economy turn down because that would be too late. So we're really in a risk management mode of managing the risk, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, managing the risk that we move too soon and move too late. And I think to move, which is which is where almost everyone on the committee is, is in favor of, of moving rates down this year. Uh, but the timing of that is going to be linked to our gaining confidence that inflation is on a sustainable path down to 2%. Welcome to the Crypto Teacher. And you know I come back with that video just to make you think. Don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel. And make sure you're joining the Patrons. If you're not a part of the Patrons, make sure you're hitting the Cash App. And we have Jerome Powell in the house. And this had to be one of his best meetings because guess what, guys? He stuck to the script. 2% inflation. And we have to be data dependent. We knew they weren't going to do anything because we know the plan. And in this meeting, they kept the questions the same and they was nice and simple. So the only thing he had to say is that we're data dependent and 2% inflation is the go. And remember, the fourth industrial revolution go is global. Majority of the central banks moved in lockstep. And the reason why they're keeping rates higher for longer, as we know, is to destroy this economy. Every day, guys, look at all the interest that we're paying. And we're on the rate of paying $1 trillion just to service the debt. This is unbelievable. If the sheep only knew, things would be different. But unfortunately, they're focused on things that don't matter. And by the time they wake up, the machines would have taken over the economy. If you don't believe me, watch the video I did last night. This technology is ready to go. The only thing they have to do is roll it out. Don't forget, guys, what Klaus stated. We're in a fragmented world. Everything has to be broken up in order for the digital transformation to happen. So that means America to Babylon has to fall along with the world reserve currency, and we'll have the rise of China with that new digital yuan, that new digital currency that's programmable, being able to tell you what, when, when, and how to buy. And now the machines have money, and that means that the sheep will be going inside the metaverse. And remember the crypto teacher told you, because he knows when it comes to the NWO, it's all planned out. You have a wonderful day. Just the term soft landing, uh, would you say at least that uh, from your point of view now, uh, 
other scenario of a hard landing caused by the Fed is off the table or the risks have diminished uh, very much. And as, uh, you mentioned um, below 2% inflation for on a three-month basis. Core PCE has been running at 1.5%. And there are those on Wall Street who think that if you maintain the level of restriction you have right now, you could end up with inflation running below your target. Uh, how do you see that? <clears throat> so how to your first question, how to describe where we are. So I, I guess I would just say this. Executive summary would be that growth is solid to strong over the course of last year. Um, the labor market, 3.7 percent uh, unemployment indicates that the labor market is strong. We've had just about two years now of, of unemployment under 4 percent. That hasn't happened in 50 years, so it's a good labor market. And we've seen inflation come down. We've talked about that. So we've got six months of good inflation data and an expectation that there's more to come. So this is, this is, a, this is a good situation, let's be honest. This is a, this is a good economy. But what's the outlook? That's looking in the review. The outlook, we do expect growth to moderate. Of course, we have expected it for some time, and it hasn't happened. But we do expect that it will uh, moderate as supply chain and labor market normalization runs its course. Um, the labor market is rebalancing, as, as I mentioned. Job creation has slowed. The base of job growth has narrowed. Um, and, of course, 12-month 12 12 uh, inflation is, is above target and, and getting – you know, getting down closer to target is not guaranteed, but we do seem to be getting on track for that. So those are the risks uh, and and questions we have to answer. But overall, this is a pretty good picture. It, it is a good picture. Um, your second question was, uh, sorry. Could you get uh, inflation that is below target, end up with inflation below target, and you have to do something about that? <clears throat> so we the thing is, we're not looking for inflation to tap the 2% base once. We're looking for it to settle out over time at 2%. And the same thing is true. If we have a month or two of lower, and we have that now, uh, of, of inflation that's annualized at a, at a lower level, that wouldn't be good. We're not, you know, we're not looking to have inflation anchor below 2%. We're looking to have it anchor at 2%. So if we do face those circumstances, then we'll have to deal with that. I think, I think as of now, you know, the, the, um, question which we want to take advantage of this situation and finish the job on inflation while keeping the labor market strong dependent we're going to be looking at this meeting by meeting um, based on the meeting today I would tell you that I don't think it's likely that the committee will reach a level of confidence by the time of the March meeting to identify March as the time to do that but that's that's to be seen um, so I wouldn't call uh, you know when you say when you ask me about in the near term, I'm hearing that as March. I would say uh, I don't think that's it's probably not the most likely case or what we would call the base case. Then your second question is on, on the is this the start of a, a when we see a cut? Is it the start of a cutting cycle or is it could it just be a one off? You know that's going to depend on the data. The whole thing is this is going to depend on the data. We're going to be looking at the economic data as it affects the outlook and the balance of risks, and we're going to make our decisions based on that. And uh, it could wind up, you know, we'll, we'll have another SEP at the March meeting and, and people will write down what they think. But in the end, it's really going to depend on how the economy evolves. We talked about there are risks that would cause us to go slower. For example, stronger inflation, more, more persistent inflation. There are risks that would cause us to go, if they happened, that would cause us to go faster or, and sooner. And that would be a weakening in the labor market or, for that matter, very, very persuasive lower inflation. Those are the kinds of things. So we're just we're just going to be reacting to the data. That's the, that's really the only way we can do this. Going to a different economy, and we're going to be learning more about that uh, as we go. But clearly, we're 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 learning that things can be done uh, from remote, remote locations. We're learning that technology can replace people even more than we thought. We're not going back to the same economy. We're going we're recovering, but to a different economy, and it'll be one that is more leverage to technology, and I worry that that is going to make it even more difficult than it was for, for many workers. In Silicon Valley and my friends who work in technology know that what we did to the manufacturing workers, we are now going to do to the retail workers, the call center workers, the fast food workers, the truck drivers, and then even bookkeepers, accountants, uh, insurance agents, lawyers, and on and on through the economy. So what happened to the manufacturing workers is a very clear sign. 
And so we'll import Chinese-based CBDC technology. So it's going to be CBDC in a box uh, provided to you by the People's Bank of China. But every stock, every bond, every currency, every commodity, every piece of art, every private business, every piece of real estate will eventually be a token on a blockchain, an entry on a ledger, permanent and immutable. We will have truth instead of trust, and we will save over $7 trillion a year. Six to 8% of global GDP is wasted by the friction of the trust industry that's necessary when you have dual entry accounting. With triple entry accounting, which is what a blockchain is, Mm -hmm. we get rid of all of that friction. It's a beautiful future. Like what you see in China and their social credit scoring systems, right? If we get identity wrong, you know, it could be a tool to enslave humanity. And if we get it right, it could be a tool to liberate humanity as an American, you know. uh, I'm obviously rooting for the, the one that's on the side of freedom. Bitcoin is an international asset. And also, I do believe the role of crypto is, um, it is, it, it, it's digitizing gold. I actually believe this technology is going to be very important. I am, I, you know, look at it. We have been part of the huge revolution in investing through ETFs. We believe that ETFs will be changing the whole way we invest. Many people still use it as a means, well, people are investing it for indexing. No, the majority of people who are putting money in an index, in an ETF are active investors that are buying exposure. The entire bond market is being transformed as we talk right now. I believe the next generation for markets, the next generation for securities will be, will be tokenization of securities. Um, we will, and if we can have that distributed ledger that we know every beneficial owner, every beneficial s- seller, we all have our, our, our code right. of who's buying, who's selling, instantaneous settlement. And think about it, it changes the whole ecosystem. The Chinese bank ICBC has been hit by a ransomware attack, and the U.S. Treasury market, as a result of that, um, has been disrupted. This, according to the Financial Times, we're going to get more right now with Bloomberg's Shanali Bassick. Shanali, what do we know? Uh, listen, we have the Financial Times now reporting that ICBC, one of China's largest banks here, was hit with a ransomware attack. And remember, they're a, a, a very significant intermediary in the Treasury market. The SIFMA has told his members that this has been part of the reason here uh, that the system has kind of clogged up, if you will, during that auction that we saw a little bit before. The attack had prevented ICBC, according to the Financial Times, from settling treasury trades on behalf of other market participants. A large executive at a major bank also telling the paper that such a large party on the fixed income clearing corp uh, creates major concerns, potentially impacting the liquidity of treasury markets. It was not just the poor auction. It was absolutely lousy, and, and uh, uh, you know, when, when the dealers have to step in to save a treasury auction, uh, that's a rare occurrence. And- so teacher and the new world order book, plus the three kids' books, it's time to re-educate. Also, Nuno Crypto's Coinbase, Bitchu, Binance. Do not forget book links and crypto links are in the description. The Stock Channel, guys. Don't forget to go like, subscribe, spread everywhere. You have your Kobo, your chip size, your banking, your gaming, while everybody's sitting at home, get on stocks, the receiver, the biotech stocks, and while everybody's at home wishing, they were still getting that free money. What are they doing? Drinking and smoking weed. Don't forget about those stocks, and you have a wonderful day. The most powerful person in the world is the storyteller. The storyteller sets the vision, values, and agenda of an entire generation to come. Steve Jobs. And guys, you know I truly believe in this. When you look at the New World Order, they're the storytellers. And that's the reason why I wrote my New World Order book. But guys, now it's time to change the current generation. And I wrote three kids' books. You know, I love the Trinity because I understand the power that's in it. So I have three books. We have an opportunity to change the generation, to educate, not just me, but I want to show you that I take action on a daily basis. And I want you to take action on a daily basis, whether it's your job, whether it's in your community. We have an opportunity right now to educate the masses. I posted this on my Twitter account. Please share. But this is a short clip of the three books. There's going to be a clothing line and action figures. 
Please get these books for your kids, nephews, cousins, friends, so therefore we can start the re-education now. Because as we see, the fourth industrial revolution foundation is definitely here. Robots, algorithms, drones, taking humanity out the picture. We have to re-educate. But let's get into the video. Part 1. King Joshua and Grandma Tim Save the village. Part 2. King Joshua and Grandma Tim Save New York. Long COVID-33. Part 3. King Joshua and Grandma Tim Goes to China. It's mandatory to get part one, part two, and part three of this series. It's time to re-educate Generation Z.